Hello, I'm Harry Sauer, a reporter for the LHS Lance newspaper. Today we will be discussing the mystery of the identity of D.B. Cooper, a 1970s aircraft hijacker. So, let's get into it. We're going to start by recapping the events of the night that D.B. Cooper hijacked an aircraft. On November 24th, 1971, a man wearing a trench coat, business suit, and a pair of silver aviator sunglasses approached the ticket counter at Portland International Airport in Oregon and bought a one-way ticket on Northwest Orient Airlines Flight 305, a short flight up north to Seattle. On his ticket, the man listed his name as Dan Cooper. Cooper later boarded Flight 305, sitting in the last row and ordering a 7-up as well as a board. Shortly after takeoff, Cooper handed a note to flight attendant Florence Schaefner. Schaefner, being a young and attractive flight attendant, assumed the note was a phone number of a lonely businessman. Schaefner dropped the note into her purse, which was when Cooper told her the note was to inform her of a bomb that was in his bag. Schaefner requested to see the bomb, and Cooper opened his briefcase, revealing two rows of four red cylinders attached to a bag. Schaefer made sure that Cooper was serious and then listened as he listed his demands, writing them down. Schaefer wanted $200,000 in cash and four parachutes. Cooper is believed to have asked for this amount of parachutes to make the government believe that he was taking hostages, not give him defective chutes. Schaefer then went to the cockpit and informed the pilots of the situation, who contacted Northwest Orient's flight operation headquarters in Minnesota and informed them of the situation. For approximately two hours, the Northwest Orient flight circled Seattle to give the FBI time to assemble Cooper's parachutes and money. The plane then landed at Seattle, and everyone deplaned minus Cooper and the flight's crew, which consisted of two pilots, a flight engineer, and three crew members. The plane was on the ground for approximately one and a half hours before taking off with Cooper and six crew members aboard. Once the plane was airborne, three aircraft from Fort Air Force Base near Lakewood, Washington, who were also airborne, training in an Air National Guard exercise nearby, diverted from their mission to follow the flight. The Air Force aircraft made sure to stay out of Cooper's view from the aircraft and flew in S flight patterns nearby. The aircraft that D.B. Cooper hijacked is called the Boeing 727. The 727 was developed by Boeing to fly shorter routes and land at smaller airports. It is a trijet with three engines around the back of the fuselage. It also had back stairs which could retract from the back of the plane. At the time the 727 was produced, there was no safety feature which disabled the stairs from being deployed in flight. Cooper initially instructed the pilots to fly him to Mexico City, but when the pilots informed him that this was not possible due to the amount of fuel they had, he instead instructed them to fly to Reno, Nevada. Shortly after this, Cooper informed Tina Mucklow, a flight attendant who was sitting with him, to open the back stairs. Mucklow, fearing she would be sucked out, refused to. Cooper reluctantly sent her to the cockpit. Sometime later, the crew members in the cockpit saw a cockpit warning light flash, indicating the 727's air stairs had been deployed. Knowing this, the crew stayed in the cockpit and eventually landed in Reno. When this happened, state troopers, FBI agents, and local authorities surrounded the plane. The captain searched the plane and confirmed that neither Cooper nor the money were still aboard, and the authorities declared the site safe. Searches around the Pacific Northwest, which is the area that D.B. Cooper possibly jumped out of the plane over, were searched, but nothing was found. That is, until this October. A she was found on the forests of Washington State. The flight attendants on that fateful night reported that Cooper was seen placing a sheet over the money before jumping. To find out if the sheet was legitimate evidence of the identity of D.B. Cooper, I contacted Eric Ullis, a D.B. Cooper expert. Okay, so the first question is, uh, what, what made you start uh, studying D.B. Cooper? Um, I think what made me start studying D.B. Cooper is, um, which was about 15 years ago, mm -hmm. is uh, just the realization that it still was unsolved. Uh, and I... I, I, you know, I've, <clears throat> it's just one of those things that appealed to me. I thought, you know, I'm going to give it a shot. I'm going to see if I can be the guy who figures it out that does the one thing that nobody else could do after, you know, 45 years or whatever. So uh, I think it was, I just sort of viewed it as a little bit of an intellectual challenge, <laughs> almost like a mind game. And I think that's what sort of uh, ultimately got me into really digging into it pretty deeply, trying to figure out what happened. Oh, okay. So you'd say you, uh, you like uh, how complex it is? Yeah, I like I like that. I like the challenge of it all, and critically, the fact that it's real. I mean, this is a real thing when you're talking yeah. Bigfoot or the Loch Ness monster, or what have you. You never really know if that's real or not. But this this is real. I mean, there was a real guy who did this, and it's a real mystery. Uh, so it's uh, so therefore, if it's real, then it is solvable. I mean, there is there is a solution. It's just a matter of figuring it out. It's like one gigantic riddle. So there's something appealing about that challenge. Right, right. So he, he is out there, which is actually got kind of part of my next question. Uh, do you believe, uh, like, any specific individual that you know of? Uh, do, you, do you have, like, any names you can say, like, uh, that you believe is D.B. Cooper? Like, so is there any specific person you believe is D.B. Cooper? I don't know who D.B. Cooper is. Um, 
there, you know, there is a gentleman that I've named, named Vince Peterson, P E T E R S E N Uh that I find interesting. He's an, he's a compelling person of interest. He seems to check off a lot of the boxes as far as the evidence goes, but I really don't know if the guy is DB Cooper was DB Cooper or not. Um, but other than that, um, my opinion is if it's not him, then it's nobody that we've heard of before that he would be a complete unknown. Hmm. Um, so, which is entirely possible. Yeah. I really just don't know at that point. And that's part of what we're, you know, obviously trying to figure out. Right, right, right. Okay. Uh, so then the next question is, uh, so the entire reason doing this article is because there's a white sheet found in uh, Vancouver, which is a city, not, not Vancouver, Canada, Vancouver, uh, Washington state. Uh, do you yeah. believe that it, so, uh, the thing is, uh, the thing, reason people are believing it's a uh, part of the case because, uh, uh, According to, I believe, one of the flight attendants, uh, D.B. Cooper was seeing, before he jumped off the plane, and before he ordered everyone to the cockpit, at least, he was seen putting a white sheet over the money bag. Uh, do you think that the white sheet found in Vancouver, Washington, do you believe that it that was that uh, was D.B. Cooper's white sheet? Well, what, what it says in the files, the FBI files, is that the flight attendant saw him trying to wrap the money in a quote-unquote white bag. Material, so it doesn't mention sheet. Oh, okay. The sheet, the sheet is intriguing just because of its age and its location of where it's found. Now, having said that, I have su- had had some analysis done on it, scientific analysis, and why that's important is because there was a very big flood in the area in 1996 that covered the area where the sheet was found. So presumably the sheet would have gotten wet during this flood in 1996 from Columbia River water. There's a very specific organism that lives within the Columbia River that presumably would be on the sheet after it dried out, that there would be some of these organisms on the sheet. But our scientific analysis showed that there were not any of these organisms on the sheet. So given that, it does not appear that the sheet was out there in 1996. So if it was not out there in 1996, then it certainly couldn't have been related to Cooper. Now, there's, it's possible that there's some explanation for you know how it could have been out there and just didn't get wet. But I'm of the opinion now that it probably is not related to D.B. Cooper just because the science does not appear to back it up. Uh, so that's kind of where that is, but that that's what this case is about is going out there searching, digging up stuff, finding, finding things that are intriguing and then vetting them, analyzing them and seeing if they perhaps have some sort of value or not. Uh, so, you know, that that's the nature of the investigation. So right now I tend to believe it's probably not related just given this recent scientific analysis. Oh, okay. All right. Wow. Uh, well, that was certainly a lot of analysis done to the sheet, uh, you know, uh, to the... The next question is, uh, again, kind of related. Uh, do you think that the FBI should reopen its case file on uh, D.B. Cooper? I hear it closed. Uh, they closed it officially in about 2015 or so. Uh, do you think they should reopen it? I don't think it's necessary to reopen it. However, one thing that would be nice is for them to cooperate or help out people like me, private citizens who are looking into the case and trying to figure out what happened. That's what's personally very frustrating is there's a lot of stuff that people like me would like to pursue, avenues we'd like to pursue with this that require the help of the FBI, Uh, but they have been unwilling to really lift a finger. So that's a little bit frustrating, but actually opening the case, reopening it and spending resources and time and money on it, I don't think that's necessary. I, I don't. To me, that doesn't make much sense. Oh, okay, okay. I uh, I read an article. I believe it was from CNN. Uh, it says that you were uh, actually suing the FBI to get more information. Uh, why would uh, what's uh, what's the reason behind that? Yeah, that's part of what I'm talking about oh, okay. here. Is there's a skinny black clip on tie that DB Cooper had that he left on the jet, and I think he accidentally left on left it on the jet. Yeah. There's a particular area of that tie that I believe that I may be able to get a DNA profile from that's not contaminated and that's actually in pretty good shape. Mm. Uh, So 
I, I requested, uh, I tried to, you know, work through back channels and, and get permission to access the tie. Uh, uh, it, well, it's in FBI headquarters in Washington, D.C., but they have been unwilling to to accommodate me. So I decided ultimately to sue them to file a lawsuit under what's called the Freedom of Information Act. And I'm basically arguing that under the Freedom of Information Act, they should be allowed access to the tie with a DNA specialist. So that's been, uh, well, I was in March when I filed that thing. So it's been eight months now, I guess, that it's been filed and still waiting to hear. You know, still, still waiting to hear from the judge. We're waiting to hear from the judge, uh, you know, with respect to some rulings here. But uh, it's a long, tedious process. It would be nice if the FBI just... Uh, just gave me access for half an hour, but uh, yeah. up to this point, they've been unwilling. So I, I don't see there's any up other opera. There's no other path. I either give up the, the battle or I decide, you know, I'm going to take it to court and see if we can, you know, pressure them or, or win a lawsuit. Okay. Do you think, uh, do you think the FBI will give in? They'll let you do that? I don't know. I mean, they've gotten quite a bit of public pressure. Oh, okay. Um, so, and, and, and up to this point, nobody's reached out to me and, Nobody's reached out to me privately from the FBI and said that they're willing to help. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't, I really don't know. Um, I think it's possible, but uh, I, I think we've got to wait to hear from the judge first on a couple of other uh, rulings. And depending upon how those rulings go, if they go against the FBI, then, then maybe they would be willing to uh, play ball and give us access. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, so my next question is, uh, why do you think uh, he, D.B. Cooper, did what he did? Like, uh, what do you think his motive was? Money. <laughs> That's it. I just think he needed the money. I mean, I think, you know, he was an older guy, probably about 50 years old. Uh -huh. uh, I think he worked in the aerospace sector. Oh, okay. And um, I think he probably was laid off because there was a big depression in the aerospace sector during that time. And a lot of people were idled or laid off, yeah. laid off at that point. And so I think he just, you know, was jammed up financially, just didn't have a job anymore and uh, was an older guy with not a lot of prospects uh, on the horizon. And I guess he figured that this was his ticket out and and $200,000 would help, which, of course, $200,000 nowadays is, you know, that's about $1.6 million. That's a lot of money. So yeah. um, I think that's it. I just think it was the money. Yeah, so it was money, uh, and you said uh, like sort of a revenge on that industry for possibly firing no, him, laying him off. I don't think there was any revenge at all. Oh, I mean, okay. Cooper conducted herself perfectly professionally. So I mean, that's part of how he got away. Is I, I you know, I, I don't. He doesn't strike me as somebody who is, you know, out to, you know, even the score or anything like that. He just strikes me as a person who was very meticulous and detailed, and he just needed two hundred thousand dollars, and he came up with a. A plan to get it. I don't. I don't think it's really any more complicated than that. I don't think there was any kind of hidden message or revenge agenda or anything like that. Oh, okay. 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 Uh, so uh, I was uh, upon re uh, while researching this article, I found out that there is actually a sort of a. Uh, I believe some. I might be. I could be wrong. I think uh, there is a link to it on your website. There's actually a, a DB Cooper convention. Uh, so you know, he obviously has yeah. a huge fan base. Uh, why do you think that is? Yeah, CooperCon is what it's called. I actually founded that. And oh, I okay. it every year. Yeah. Um, so the first year was 2018. So we just finished it this weekend. Yesterday it was a three-day event. Yesterday was the third day. So oh, wow. um, and it takes place in Seattle, three-day events, a lot of fun. You get a lot of witnesses and people that were, you know, involved in the case in some way. And oh, okay. Scientific analysis. But it's just an interesting case. And especially here, I'm in Seattle right now. Uh, I mean, this is sort of the, this is where it all kind of happens. So it's legendary up here in the Pacific Northwest. Yeah. yeah. And um, so, uh, but yeah, that, I mean, it's just, it's just a fun annual event it takes place every November. And uh, so next year will be the sixth one. But yeah, so it's just a lot of fun and it's really informative and really interesting. It's mm -hmm. just a fascinating case. So it's, yeah, that, that's, you know, people demand it. So I, I decided to do it. So. Is the sheet that was discovered viable evidence? Well, no government agency has officially begun reinvestigating D.B. Cooper, but several private individuals have taken the sheet as legitimate evidence. So far, no investigations have gone far regarding the sheet. 